complete right now. We have uh, uh, the next episode, episode two of the JHR Threads. Uh, I'm Scott Cunningham, Associate Editor of Research Impact at uh, the Journal of Human Resources. And to, today I have with me Michael Kofed uh, uh, from West Point. So what is the economic question that you're trying to answer in this paper? I've always wondered to myself if there aren't laws and rules that are keeping women or people of color from choosing majors or choosing occupations, then why is it that 80% of nurses are women? And we have very few female uh, computer programmers or female uh, PhD economists, as we've had a long discussion about in the last year or two. Mm. So, so why is it that we don't see those people sorting in to these certain jobs or majors? And that's always kind of interested me a little bit into that. And so we would think that perhaps it's an information story. Yeah. Maybe people perceive the marginal cost as being really high because traditionally there has been that discrimination, or maybe the discrimination is not as explicit as it used to be, but it still could be implicit, like with implicit bias. Right. And so showing this in a great kind of quasi-experimental setting, I think is really important. Mm. Uh, for example, if we wanna have more uh, female econ PhDs, then we need to have more female tenured academics, for example. Uh. So I was wondering, could you tell me what that term leaky bucket means in the Army context? And so in the Army, you sometimes hear it called a leaky pipeline. And so leaky bucket, leaky pipeline, same kind of story. So one thing that the Army has in its labor market is it's not like it can go out and hire someone that could come in and be a middle manager. But the Army has this issue where it can only promote from within. And so that's where it's sets up this pipeline where I'm pushing in, especially in the officer corps, these 22 year olds coming out of college, whether they did West Point ROTC, and they're gonna be commissioned as a second lieutenant, and they have to work their way up to the organizational structure. And so one of the issues the Army finds itself with, much like academia, is I start with a lot of female and black and Hispanic second lieutenants, that lowest rung of people coming out of college. But then when I look on the upper run, like the general officer corps, it seems like all, a lot of the women and people of color have kind of disappeared. And so why is it that somewhere along this career path from second lieutenant to general or flag officer, where did we lose all these talented individuals? But after five years, about 50% of them leave the army and go into the private sector. And so what we're a little bit worried about is maybe we are losing, so one argument could be we're losing the people that didn't cut it and that didn't like that army lifestyle, or we could be losing the people that have the highest outside value in the private sector. And so thus the army essentially retains only those that don't have a whole lot of options outside of the army. You use this funny word uh, that a lot of viewers outside of economics maybe have never heard of uh, called homophily. Mm -hmm. And um, I was wondering if you would tell us what that is and then why is it, why does it matter for a researcher trying to answer the question that you're trying to answer? I tend to like to hang out or surround myself with people that, that look like me or share interests that I do, right? So, I mean, you can go to a conference and all the education labor people are going out to dinner together right. to talk about research. But I wouldn't want to say, uh, hey, let's think about the pure effect of people at labor at the Southern Economic Association Conference, because we're choosing to surround ourselves with people like that. Right, right. So it'd be really hard to test that in a real, you know, like a civilian setting, where, for example, at West Point, I don't get to choose. I walk in, I'm, I put in the sorting hat, to use the Harry Potter analogy, right. and I'm put in company 4D, and I show up and I find out the company 4D's tack is male or female or white or black, and that's chosen for me. So as new freshmen come into West Point, they are randomly sorted into what's called a company. And a company has about 120 cadets. Those cadets are gonna eat together, sleep together. They don't necessarily take classes together, but they do study an awful lot together. They're gonna be randomly assigned. And after your freshman year, 
you're going to be what's called scrambled, only assigned to a second company. Mm -hmm. And for this paper, uh, each company is randomly assigned an officer that's pulled out of the army for a three-year tour. This army is the officer is called a tactical officer. So this randomization, uh, how random is it? How do you know it's random? So, so yeah, so we know that there are some things that they do try to control for us, so it's conditionally random. They want to make sure that there's equal number of women, for example, in each company, mm. and that the SAT score or ACT score is about average in each of the companies. Kind of new technique we used, which was called randomized inference, what we did, mm -hmm. was imagine that we, we could create these companies for West Point. So we took kind of their algorithm and created placebo companies. And so we create 10,000 placebo companies, and we say, do these 10,000 placebo companies look like the real companies in my data? And those two distributions match, which we would want to see. Tell me about this Kolmogorov Smirnoff test statistic. I don't think a lot of people know about that. So what that test is going to do is, again, it's going to test, as I create these 10,000 placebo companies, we're going to test whether or not that uniformness actually exists. Mm -hmm. So that Kolmogorov Smirnoff test is going to say, it's kind of like a hypothesis testing that says, is this a uniform distribution? And is the skewness of the distribution similar to the real data that I have off to the side? Wow. And if I have a purely random sample, then I would create 10,000 companies. And if I plotted their distribution, it should be uniform because getting five women in my company versus 10 women in my company would have an equal probability. So in economics, uh, we tend to say people are just doing what they want to do you know, under some constraint. Yeah. Right? And so if I see 80% of the nursing population is female, or I see underrepresentation of women and minorities in some particular occupation, well, I just say it's preferences. You know, like that in economics jargon, that you just say that's preferences, preferences and they're just optimally sorting. They're just doing what they want to do. If you think about it for maybe my, my first semester PhD micro, you're taking a midterm, and the professor says, here's the utility function, maximize it against the budget constraint, right? And, and sometimes we as economists say, okay, the utility function comes down exogenously, we maximize against the budget constraint. Where does that utility function then come from, right? right? Is someone just randomly endowed with preferences, or are those preferences being shaped over time by the people that they're exposed to? by the experiences that they have. And so that's why I think what this paper shows us is that these preferences for jobs, at least within West Point and the Army, are being shaped by the people that these female and black cadets interact with. You could just give me uh, your, uh, what, this, what you find in this paper. So what we find is that if I'm a female cadet and I randomly assign to a female officer, but I'm about four and a half percent more likely to pick the same job that that officer had. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm a female cadet and I see a female officer that's maybe an aviator that flies helicopters, then I'm more likely to pick aviation as my first choice mm -hmm. as a job. And if I'm a black cadet, then I'm more likely to choose at a similar rate if the officer is also black. So the policy implications are for an organization that has some goals, one of the mechanisms they might consider is just, you know, prioritizing particular groups of people in particular pathways and putting those people there. Putting right. people. Well, Mike, this is a fascinating study, really important scientific study, but also for policymaking. And it's, uh, I'm so glad you, uh, spent, gave me a little bit of your time to talk about it. I really appreciate you uh, doing this thread with me.